bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Transcription services provided by transcribeme.com. Visit them on the web at transcribeme.com slash beancast for up to 25% off. That's transcribeme.com. Episode 505, Does Nazi Pizza Still Taste Good? Monday, July 23rd, 2018. It's time for this week's edition of the Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. Advertising is built around creative genius that person or select group of people who consistently churn out the award-winning work. But has dependence on creative genius enabled a culture of bad creative process? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, why aging means more than ever to marketers. How GDPR is keeping ad deals from getting done. Television's dramatic evolution. Plus this week's AdFell 5. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the president of marketing consultancy, Future Forth, Mr. Dave Delaney. Hey, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Now, also with us, we have the CEO of Liquid Agency, Mr. Scott Gardner, joins us for the first time. Scott, welcome to the program. Thanks, Bob. I'm excited for my maiden voyage on the Beancast. <laughs> we all have our first time. And, fi- <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we welcome back the Chief Consciousness Officer of the Conscious Marketing Institute, Ms. Nicole Kelly. Nicole, welcome back. Thank you so much. Well, we've got a lot to cover, and I'm going to jump right into the topics, as I usually do when we record this program. And first up, we've all heard the term creative rock star. It's one of those terms that gets thrown around pretty liberally in the advertising industry. Typically, it refers to that person or persons in the organization who continually win endless awards and, as a result, make fabulous salaries in order to prevent them from being poached by our competitors. But does this focus on a singular creative genius or a group of creative geniuses actually ignore the fundamental truth that good ideas can come from anywhere, Scott, and as a result, uh, enable a broken creative process at most agencies in the business? So what do you think about that? Is this an enabling feature of bad creative process, or does creative genius actually play a super important part of every agency's lifestyle? Well, I think I think uh, everyone loves rock stars, Bob, and I think uh, especially the ones that uh, perform on a stage, usually with instruments. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think the you know the industry has a long history of making rock stars out of creative leads when things are hot, and um, you know I think we're always going to have them, but I think, I think the business is changing quite a bit, and I think we're going to feel less of less of it in the than in the past. And I think there's two reasons why that's happening. I think, first of all, you know, creative alone is not the total solution these days. I mean, companies are so integrated with strategy and digital gurus and social gurus that I, I believe that we've come to more of a level playing field of who brings forth the ideas. And I also think we're, you know, we're in a changing time where some of the rock star persona also led to bad behavior in companies and, and different types of cultures that I think everybody's trying to change. Do you really think, though, that the creative genius is on the way out? Because uh, over and over again, you see these big moves when you're reading the ad press. You've got these really big names within the industry, whether they're, you know, bad behavior people or good behavior people is really irrelevant. It's just whether or not they've won big awards and they make big moves to this new agency. It seems like there's so much PR value in having a creative rock star that people would not want to sacrifice that in, you know, maybe solving their creative problems by using the people that they have. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're definitely in the headlines. And again, all the publications love to find somebody to to put on that stage. And, you know, we've seen it for years with the Boguskis and the Drogas, and there's the next person and the, the ones before that. It was interesting. I was at the Ad Age Small Agency Conference this week, and Lee Clow from uh, Chite Day spoke for the first time at an Ad Week Ad Age Conference. And it was interesting. He talked about 50 years of Chite Day. Uh, you know, he is, I think, probably one of the most decorated Hall of Fame creatives. He didn't talk about himself at all. He talked about Jay Chite. He talked about the way they worked. He talked about Steve Jobs. So I think he was a pretty humble rock star in my opinion. I think that's the kind of rock stars that I think we want to see out there in the industry. Yeah. Yep, would... yep. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Go, no, no go Nicole, ahead. you go, go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say that, you know, the, the thing about this is that's always interesting is when we start talking about creative genius, there, we, we kind of need to talk about what true creative genius is. For me, that doesn't mean that you won a bunch of awards because quite frankly, that just means you have people to submit you for awards. But true creative genius is something that can't be created. It can't be trained. And so when you have these people inside your organization that deliver magic inside your client and inside of your internal team's relationships, the question that I would be asking is, you know, how can I help this person? How can I support this level of incredible inside of my organization? What can I learn from this person? And then where does my zone of genius fit? Because it's creative genius is, is typically celebrated in the industry, but there are many zones of genius that are appreciated and rewarded as well. And so instead of creating this competition against the creative genius, I think it's time that we start really supporting it, especially as we have massive changes coming into the industry where the data that we've been using to make decisions is, is likely to be going away soon. You know, creative genius mm. is such a nebulous thing, though, when you think about it, because it's not just the fact that somebody is naturally creative and comes up with all the big ideas. It's also a matter of whether or not you have the cool account and whether or not you have a client who's willing to be risky and take uh, interesting turns in terms of their creative. I mean, that's that's the key for most successful creative executions. And, and quite frankly, only the rock stars are getting those accounts. So it, it's not necessarily that the, you need to be a rock star in order to create the the incredible the incredible creative execution. It's more about a confluence of a whole bunch of things coming together, right? So, you know, couldn't we create a better creative process with the people that we have and still end up at the same place? I think you can have the rock star, though. I mean, I think you can have that creative genius, but also if that genius is also a great leader, then they can actually, you know, collaborate with teams and get insights and ideas from the team. So it's more of a collaboration. So yeah, while they may be the big name, um, they're bringing people together from the company with different perspectives, different backgrounds and so on to help develop great campaigns. Yeah, I would agree. And also that it, it's not, uh, many times I find that the actual creative genius behind something isn't the one that's being celebrated. It's not the mm. person who is the rock star, quite frankly. It usually is the person who can take a creative's idea and execute it in market and sell it into a client. And we give that creative genius a ton of credit, I agree, but a true creative genius learns how to collaborate and co-create amongst a team and actually execute their ideas, which many times is beyond the, the creative genius's ability. Okay, so mm -hmm. so we all, we all agree that creative genius can play a role within the organization that's very valuable. And obviously there's a lot of PR value in having a creative genius join your shop. I mean, I think, Scott, you as an agency leader would have to admit that when you get a big name creative genius in in house, it, it presents you with a lot of PR value that can be then turned around and offered to the client. But does it also enable a kind of um, like complacency in terms of fixing broken process within the organization? And you know, how do you avoid that? How do you take that creative genius and actually enable all the creatives within an organization to perform better work? Yeah, I think, I mean, in our situation, because we're almost a hybrid agency and consultancy, we're, we're straddling that line that it's been discussed a lot. I mean, creative, definitely, we want to do great creative work. We want creative leaders that are strong, that are passionate. You know, we want rock stars, per se, but it's such a organization of collaboration, and, and, and we're so heavy on the strategy side that sometimes the strategic leaders and the creative leaders are you know, almost on such an even playing field for how we approach the work. 
And I do think this is what we're seeing a lot of in the in the business. And you know, it it you know, I, I think uh, you know, Dave made a good point. We do want to love the rock star, but especially if they're a great leader, if they cultivate ideas, if they mentor, if they do a good job with mm-hmm. customers, the aloof ones, the ones that kind of want all the glory and they they don't want to allow other credit taken by their departments and collaborators. I've had a few of those in my day and they do not take an organization forward. And that comes down to the leadership of the company as well. So, you know, if it's a CEO or CEO or whomever that's in charge of, of hiring and placing that, that creative ninja rock star person, it's, it's up to them to make sure that that creative rock star is also being partnered up with the, the right people, the team so that they can collaborate. Someone's moving their microphone a lot, so be careful about that. But um, uh, can a distributed output of creative excellence ever cope to win out, though, within an organization? Because, um, you know, it seems like there's so much about the industry that's built around having a singular person or some kind of big name creative director or big name creative um, team brought in that helps us to sell our work to the clients. It's almost like there's a lot of vested interest in having this big name involved with the organization. So is there any way for you to have more of a factory type approach to creative where you don't have any big names, but there's a a serious process and a serious output of great work on a continual basis? You know, I can't think of a single example where that's the case. You know, I can think of people who put out decent creative, um, but when you want outstanding creative, you kind of have to have this big name person who's involved with the organization. Um, am I wrong about that, or does anybody have any examples of some work? I mean, Nicole, what's your what's your take on that particular position? Yeah, thank you. I mean. So I, I have experienced inside, um, inside an agency environment as well as inside a client where we were able to create a flow state of creative genius across a 25, 30 person team. And it was because we started to take a look at things differently, like how do we get people into creative flow state to begin with? And we looked at their office environments, we looked at the hours that they were working, and we had a process for rapid prototyping ideas that allowed us to test them in market within two hours and then decide if they worked and if we needed to keep going. But that process was ultimately designed to make sure that we were measuring towards the objective and that the the biggest the best creative always won which may not be the you know the pretty glamorous campaign we were working off of an effectiveness solution and we were increasing ROI 400 to 500% for for clients so i have seen that happen what i see the challenge is is that in the typical agency environment Um, process is usually focused on getting the work out the door to the client and less so on how do we create creative flow state inside of our organization. So how do you you fix that? I mean, how do you like make that better? Because that's what you're describing is exactly in my estimation, what the core of the problem is that we fix the process of getting the work out to the client, but we don't optimize the process of actually coming up with the great ideas. Yeah, well, it, it really requires strong leadership who's w- that are really willing to break the mold. Like we had to, we had to allow people to work whenever they wanted to work because we knew that some people's flow state is in the morning and some people's is at night. We created a work from anywhere culture because one of our employees traveled the world full time, you know, and that's how he got his creative inspiration. Um, and then you combine it with a process that supports and is flexible so that everybody can rapid prototype their ideas. But without strong leadership, it simply doesn't work. And then mm-hmm. when we implemented that inside of a team, inside of a client, what we found is that team became the highest performing team inside the organization. Um, but it wasn't, they couldn't, they couldn't take it outside of their team because it wasn't coming from leadership. It was coming from, you know, and a team actually executing. So my, my answer is that, you know, you really have to have strong leadership who's willing to do the things like Steve Jobs did, which were completely break the mold and look at a totally different way of working. Yeah, we, uh, years ago, we did kind of move and shift our workflow processes at the agency. And because we were born out of Silicon Valley, we looked at 
like the agile workflow of technology companies and we'd worked with a lot of them. We said, well, what if we applied that to our agency? And I will say when we started talking about rapid prototyping and agile strategy and swarming uh, and immersive collaboration of skill sets, a lot of old line people were nervous. They wanted to do things the traditional waterfall way. They wanted to take the time and make these beautiful presentations and sell ideas to clients. But we said, no, we want to do it differently. We want to iterate uh, and collaborate with customers and be more agile. And I think to do that, a creative leader's got to be more empathetic. They got to believe in the power of teamwork. Um, they definitely have to be, have a little bit more humility and they have to have some courage to try something different. Well, this is all great thoughts, but we're going to move on to the next topic. McCann released an aging report that provides some fascinating insights into the changing perspectives on how we respond to different messaging at different stages of our lives. Nicole, t take us through the big takeaways of this particular study. I think it's pretty fascinating. And how does this affect our messaging to not just old people, but also younger consumers? Well, what I think we're seeing is that the data is starting to support that we are in a really interesting time. You have the boomer generation that is aging out, as they say. You have the Gen X generation that's aging in, coming into like truly senior leadership positions, C-level positions. And then you have the millennial generation coming in, also taking on leadership roles. So the interesting thing, and there's, there's cycles that predict this stuff, but essentially right now what's happening is that old is the new chick. We have young people who are dying their hair gray. That never would have happened, you know, in my generation. Um, <laughs> We have a vibrant elderly population that's healthy and full of wisdom because we've had better nutrition and better you know, processes around fitness and all of these things. But right now, when you look at the advertising that's, that's really targeted to the aging population, it makes the outlook look really grim for the young generation from impotence, incontinence, uncontrollable diarrhea, and whatever else the pharmaceutical industry is pimping, <laughs> it doesn't appeal. And so I think what the outcome of studies like this is that the attitude really needs to shift towards aging into from that model that traditionally has shamed women while glorifying men and having more advertising that's focusing on women and men who are getting better with age, reveling in their changing bodies and appreciate their newfound freedom. And that's going to inspire generations across the board. So this idea that we're marketing to one generation, I, I just see that really evolving into a collaboration between all generations. And when you're talking about aging in particular, I mean, like being told that it's going to suck when you're old, your whole life isn't fun for anyone. So I think we could do a better job. You know, I'm so glad you set it up like this, because when I started to wrestle with this particular topic in preparing for the show, one of the things that came to my mind is that this is so frigging complicated anymore. It's not just about marketing to an elderly population with an elderly message. And it's not just about marketing to younger people with a more vibrant message. I mean, you're absolutely right. What, what we're saying to the older generation is not affecting the older generation nearly as much as it's affecting the younger generation. I mean, I found it fascinating that millennials are way more concerned about aging than 70 year olds. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. What is that about? I mean, <laughs> well, I think that part of it is also that there's just more information and education, right? So when you say that you're worried about aging, like the real question is, what is it that you're worried about? What I, my experience with the millennial generation is that they're smarter about aging. They're taking care of their skin. They're taking care of their bodies. They're eating healthy. They're not getting caught into the monolith of advertising that's telling them to eat processed foods and all of those kind of things. And what I'm millennials that. do you know? Because the millennials I know are not doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I don't know, perhaps I travel in some conscious circles where nutrition is a, a, like, is a little different. But like what I see from the millennial generation is a, a level of awareness about health that includes that I am going to be preventive about aging versus trying to address it after the fact. Well, fair, fair points. I mean, Dave, what's your take on this? I mean, it's just like, well, how do we manage messaging when we, we, we have a specific target that we're going after, we're, we're mm -hmm. say we're going after an older generation, say 50 to 70 or something like that. And do we need to constantly be aware of what the impact of that messaging is going to be to a younger generation that 
could potentially be impacted um, negatively by the messaging we're giving to the older generation in when we're trying to market products that are more appropriate to their age as well. And it's, it's, it's such a complicated thing anymore. Yeah, it is. And I mean, yeah, you can't, you can't please everybody, I guess. But I think, I think really with intergenerational, like I, I did some searches of intergenerational ads out of curiosity before the call. And I noticed that like most of them feature like family portraits and father, son stuff or mother, daughter stuff and more like tradition based stuff. And so sort of, I came to the conclusion that it's like really well-established brands with like rich histories can, can really do well with intergenerational, but it is definitely more complicated. Like I'm talking like big brands that are very familiar that like my son will be familiar with when, when, you know, he's older and I'm much older and, you know, things like, or, or my, myself and my dad. Um, so I think it really depends obviously on, on the, the products that you're, you're marketing and advertising, of course, but I think these older brands can take advantage of this kind type of advertising for sure. I think, uh, creatively it's interesting because, you know, just as much as in the last segment we talked about rock stars and great creative, which we see a lot of, there's also a lot of bad advertising we see. I mean, look at late mm. night TV and other things. And unfortunately, those are sometimes the places that are running the ads targeted at the, you know, the more age age demographic. Um, I, I was just thinking that maybe the breakthrough with smart marketers and great brands, as Dave mentioned, is that if somebody could kind of do the equivalent of like the real beauty campaign that Dove came out with years ago, mm -hmm. this breakthrough, break the mold. Imagine if somebody could start to break that through with marketing towards the uh, to to this this demographic. Yeah, but when we're we're talking about that particular campaign, it was a pretty straightforward approach. It was marketing to women, and it was saying that all body types and all body shapes and sizes are acceptable and that we're a product that values beauty in all its many forms which is a, a, a really broad brush stroke but what's what's interesting about this dilemma when you're talking about aging is like do we try to get micro and we try to speak uh, more specifically to all the different aging concerns of all the different audiences or do we paint in big broad brush strokes that can affect all the audiences at once I mean I'm not really sure which way to go. What would you say about that, Scott? I mean, how would you approach that? Well, I use the real uh, beauty campaign more because it was authentic and because it showed, I mean, you talked about millennials and how they see advertising. They want meaning and they want purpose from the brands that they respect and, and connect to. And I was just saying that if you could bring the same spirit of authenticity to how you market products, because you know, even the research that we saw from McCann, there's a lot of segments within this aging population, and some of them are pretty dynamic. But I don't think when you look at how they're portrayed and how they're marketed to, I think somebody's missing the point that they're not so stereotyped in an old way. There's there's an opportunity to just go forward uh, in, a, in a real more enriching, positive way to that, that target for sure. Yeah. I would say that the other opportunity here is to, like, really start to understand generational dynamics, you know, like the... Um, I'm fortunate in that one of my close friends is a generational theorist, so I have these conversations often about the different generations, but there mm -hmm. are predictable patterns of how what language is effective, what their value systems are, and it repeats through history, and it's like a 40-year cycle. And so if you start to understand that, then you can start to craft language. You know, For example, we're coming into a fourth turning right now, which is a major generational shift. And every time we've come into a fourth turning, it starts in 2020, uh, the year 2020, and then through 2024. This is a time where in the past, there's there's this big unknown transformational event that's going to happen. And the last two were World War II and the Civil War. You know, so like the question is 2020 to 2024, what's going to happen and how's it going to impact these generations? So, so maybe you can explain a fourth turning a little bit more to us before. You... Sure. Sure. So the fourth turning is essentially the end of a 40 year cycle in history. And I'm totally not the expert on this, but I, I, I've watched a few of the videos and basically it's the last four years of this cycle. And what happens at the last four years of this cycle is that there's some catalyst for change. 
a huge catalyst for change. And what it does is it essentially shakes out all the negativity and unifies the population again. And then the population makes transformation that begins in 2024. And then that'll go through 2044. So this has happened we like in our lifetimes beyond these generations this has happened twice already and in that four year turn in the in the fourth turning each time there's been a war and so the question right now is what is going to be our fourth turning and when you do things like divide people and put them into segments and 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 show people that they're separate from each other it creates this divide, this division between people. But what we're seeing in marketing right now that I find just fascinating is for the first time, marketers are not looking so much as how to divide, but we're looking at how to unify. And I think this conversation around age hmm. is a perfect example of, of that. So you, uh, if I can maybe paraphrase what you're saying, reflect back a little bit about what you're telling us, um, you're essentially advocating for more of a unified approach to the marketing messaging and, and less focusing on the specific needs of the generational um, concerns that each particular generation has. I mean, uh, how, how, are we, how are we handling the aging question going forward? Yeah, I think it's about understanding the difference in the aging populations, right? Like understanding the difference between Gen Xers and boomers and millennials is critical. But if you understand that, then you can see what's common between all of them and mm -hmm. how we can coll create collaboration amongst the generations. It's incredibly important right now because millennials have these really grand ideas for how to change the world, but they need Gen Xers to help them get it done because Gen Xers know how to get things done. And we look to our elders for wisdom, which is the boomer generation, because they've been through this before. And if we can unify that across and show like the beauty of wisdom going from generation to generation and that we age gracefully together and our families get more supportive and you're seeing, you know, models pop out that are like 70 years old that are super celebrities and their followers are millennials. So I just mm. think that that's really telling that the society is evolving and we have this opportunity to really to stop putting people into buckets while recognizing what their commonalities are, but really focusing on unifying them across the board. Yeah, that's really great. That's great. Great points. I mean, there, one of the the ads that I, I'd mentioned that I was looking at was in Nat West. It was called Nat West Father and Son, and you can find it on YouTube. But that ad showed like is a British ad, of course, and it showed like the father, the aging father and the, and the, and the son who's obviously aging as well and how they both use the bank. And, 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 you know, and it kind of brings them together, but it takes it from both different, different perspectives so that any ad viewer of any age would probably appreciate the ad and it would, you know, it would resonate with them. So I like, I like what you're saying about trying to, you know, trying to incorporate these ads for everyone so that, you know, cause all of us have parents, you know, right. or grandparents and children and so on. So we can all kind of understand and, and recognize that. You know, what's interesting about the way this conversation has turned, and it has taken an, an interesting turn that I did not expect, is um, when, it, when you compare what you're saying, Nicole, to what has been said in the McCann study, the McCann study seems to imply that we need to be more conscious of the, the effects of the aging process on every single different generation and maybe tailor our message to better um, affect all these different audiences. So it seems to be more of a segmented approach, but the approach you're taking seems a, a lot more effective overall that it's, it takes a more holistic view of the audience and says, uh, we're, we're, we need to have a multi-generational approach to aging. We need to not think about aging from the perspective of how it impacts every single age demographic, but that we take it in more of a holistic way that embraces the fact that we are in a process and a journey with all the different age groups and that mm. there's a part of this story that Im impacts all of us. Yeah, I think that, mm -hmm. well, this is what happens in research studies, right? Like we segment the data and therefore we think the answer is to then segment the people who are affected by the data. 
you segmented the data so that you could show us analysis of what is important of these different age groups. But that doesn't mean that our response is then to then turn and, and segment our audience. The question really is, can you create that unified message that also resonates at each age group? That's creative genius, tying it back into our other conversation, because mm. that is something that that creates movement in people that creates inspiration in people that makes me feel like I belong, like I'm supported, that I have tribe. And the thing that we need the most right now is feeling that we have tribe. We've become so separated mm. with our devices and the way we're using social media that people actually feel more isolated. So I just see this as a huge opportunity that to really evolve the industry completely, we need to, to understand people's buckets and then, and then look at how we get people into the same pool ultimately and how we can talk in a unified voice, especially because with GDPR and the data regulations, and you know I'm a data geek, um, as this stuff is coming down, I mean, the big thing for the marketers that we really need to understand is that the veil is falling and we're not going to be able to track this much data going forward. Consumers are going to be outraged when they understand how much data we have on them. So this segmentation we can even do now, I see going away in the next five to 10 years. You know, speak, hey, Nicole, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, Nicole, thanks for bringing up the word tribe. I mean, at, at Liquid, we are big believers in the idea of tribes and been talking about it for years. And I think the key is exactly what we're touching on is that, you know, tribes are really are the commonalities of why people love a brand, whether that be the employees or customers or the future customers. And I think we're taught so much to think about segments, but I think to build a brand long term and start to build a bigger tribe that influences others. And today, brands are being built more by tribes and referral than they are through marketing messages in a mm -hmm. traditional sense. So that that's the key, we believe, to build a brand. But at the end of the day, as you go downstream and you get into your data and your media and you get your mediums, that's when you have to get, you know look at your segmentation messages. But I think I think people are getting confused, but we're, we're definitely all in on the whole idea of this commonality of tribe. Well, you brought up GDPR, Nicole, and I want to move on and talk a little bit about this mystery that's happening. It's always been a certain amount of mystique about why programmatic deals aren't getting done. Uh, there's often people talking about we need to open the kimono and show each other what's going on behind the scenes or else we're never going to get this figured out. But now with GDPR in place, along with the resulting confusion over its implementation requirements, Publishers are noticing that much of their ad inventory isn't even being listed by many of the demand side platforms, even when the audience has provided permission to receive messaging. So Dave, is this the result of GDPR confusion alone, or is this a signal of more fundamental problems with the programmatic space? Which would you say? Yeah, so <laughs> what I was reading about was 80% of companies are still not GDPR compliant right now so that's a problem and uh, you know onto itself but dsps are not reading consent signals in a standardized way and i think that's a big problem um you know from what i understand with it um you know iab's methodology is not accepted by all dsps and then also google's is different as well so i think there i think th there lacks a, a sort of standardized way to do this um effectively so it seems so that's kind to of what me I'm running when, into right now at least when i when i was looking at this story you know that's that's the takeaway i initially had it's like mm. there there needs to be standardization brought to the process and we need to have some kind of agreed approach to how we justify whether or not somebody should receive an ad or not. But then as I started to like look back through my notes from previous programs and look back at conferences I've attended and look back at all the conversations I've had with programmatic individuals, uh, this, this doesn't sound any different. It just sounds like a magnified problem that has been existing in the industry since the beginning of the programmatic revolution. It seems like forever in a day, we've had this issue where ad deals are not getting done because someone somewhere is not approving the inventory. Someone There's, there's like no standardization of, involved anywhere. And GDPR has just exacerbated a fundamental problem with the industry. Uh, am I wrong in that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think you're onto something there, but I think I think it really does come 
down to standardization and and so that everybody is on the same page with how this exactly works because i mean obviously there's still a lot of confusion um one article i read said that uh gdpr PR implementation is underway or or completed has increased 38 percent to 66 percent in us and then 37 to 73 percent in the uk so it seems that people you know, are starting to implement it and, and understanding it or starting to understand at least, but I still think the system's kind of broken as far as people completely understanding, you know, how it, how it is supposed to work. Nicole, you know, I'm coming to you with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being the data I mean, geek of the group here. So yeah. what's your take on this? I mean, is there a fundamental flaw in the programmatic system that's keeping deals from getting done and GDPR is just exposing that flaw or is there a way to simply fix this problem by a quick standardization of the GDPR principles? And is it even possible to standardize GDPR considering the fact that nobody understands what's actually going to get them sued by the, the European U Union? I mean, the, yeah, I mean, I think that's the big point here is like what what level of importance do you give GDPR? And I would say that you should put it at the top of the priority list because quite frankly, it's the right thing to do. What the, what the European Union did with the, with the rights of people and their privacy is important and it's an important move. And the other thing is that people are really confused about this. I did a podcast with uh, Chris Penn and he pointed out that mm. you know GDPR applies if someone is traveling in Europe and they come to your site, you're required to be compliant. And so it's not just citizens. You don't have to have citizenship to be protected from this. And so I think we have no choice but to start um, complying with GDPR. But I think what we found is that software providers are woefully underprepared for this. And they really have not built in the technology that's required to do this effectively okay, across the Okay, channel. before you get into that, because I think that's a really important opinion, I, I want to back up for a second and talk about the fact that even if you want to be compliant, even if you do put this to the top of your priority list, you really don't understand what you need to do in order to be compliant. I mean, the, the opinions that are out there are so divergent about how to handle even something as simple as an opt-in. Uh, do, do we need people mm -hmm. to opt into our email database or do we just update our terms of service? I mean, and, and the European Union is not giving any help in terms of clarification. So how do we get to this place? I mean, there, sorry. I was just, I, I was just going to say really quickly, and I know y you'll be able to speak better to this, but I, I did notice um, there was a great Forbes article July 6th that was a nine-point checklist for successful compliance, um, which I reviewed. And, you know, they 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 broke it down pretty clearly what, what you need to do. But go ahead, Nicole. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I was going to suggest just that, like there are some really good companies out there that likely want to sell you something. They want to sell you a solution, but what they're giving away are these checklists. And mm -hmm. so go get one of these checklists and then audit yourself and, and, and always, always consult a legal opinion on this because this is a legal issue. You know, this isn't um, my creative is, you know, not good enough to perform. This is like there's lawsuits on the back end of this. So um, I would hire an attorney. And, and also, like, I do think that the the truth of the matter is you have to ask who's the best to solve this and i don't think that client side or agency side is the best to create solutions to solve this i think this needs to be integrated into the software that we're using because it is com it's complex can i ask a question so about the the before before we move on i i just want to ask this simple question about the checklist because if we know that people have divergent opinions about what about how to handle this situation should we depend upon a single checklist or should we always be seeking multiple checklists and see where the dichotomy is and then consult legal opinion based on those dichotomies that are not mar marrying up with each other I think doing so your Bob, initial homework. We, we, oh, sorry, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I just I, I'm jumping in because you know we have been looking at this, and we've actually started with our the legal side and specialty within our law practice that's looked at this for quite a while. I mean, there are the there's the U.S. checklist, there's the European Union checklist, and there's also as a as an agency for hire, there's what's the client's position. If you're dealing with a global brand and you're building tools and doing marketing for them, you're under their MSAs, you're under their their profile. So we've kind of looked at it as, and what we found is that because the 
you know, the internet's a global global thing. We're almost looking at the U.S. plus the plus the EU version for compliance here because we. It, it almost seems like the U.S. one is is too limiting. So that's one thing we're trying to focus on, whether it's for ourselves as a marketer or customers we know that we manage those pieces. But if you have a bigger client, a global enterprise, you know their MSAs, you almost have to go back and say, well, look, what's your policy on EPR? Because you know then we're just in, we're following your policies because you're, you're really you know again we're we're for hire. Hmm. And Nicole, you mentioned Chris Penn. Uh, Chris is a great person to for for your listeners, Bob, to to follow, and because he's writing about this stuff a lot, so and he's definitely uh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I would say, um, yeah, for sure. Like Chris would be my expert at Brain Trust because um, mm -hmm. he he really has done the research on this more so than anyone else I know, and he also understands the data side. Um, mm -hmm. and it, 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 this is, this is one that requires technical expertise to implement in my opinion. Agreed. And for the sake of Christopher, I will say that he loves to be called Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, I will add that being a Silicon Valley based company, it, this reminds me a little bit of like the March to Y2K when, you know, planes were going to unfortunately maybe fall out of the sky on, on, uh, on the first day of the new millennium um, and technology was a big part of it and people built practices. I think the difference that we're facing now is, you know, there's it's not the potential concerns and we all saw how Y2K ended up, but it's more the fines and, you know, being responsible to your consumers and customers. But it is, I think it's just going to be a big wave of work. It's going to drive a lot of work for a lot of companies and certain people actually will benefit a lot from just the act of even trying to be compliant and responsible. I would also say that like it's it's not just about GDPR right now. I mean, the reality is is that with the what we've had with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, we've had data leaks and data breaches, all of these different things happening across many industries, happening with marketing data. The reality is is that we need to prepare for consumers to know how much data we're give we're tracking and for them to be able to remove it because if mm -hmm. we're not Caring in that direction to do what's in the best interest of the customer, we're going to end up getting caught with our pants down again. And and we're trying to build trust with our audiences, not be these like marketers behind the scenes that are collecting all this data and they have no idea, quite frankly. Um, so I think it's about GDPR. But the bigger thing I see here is that we as marketers need to need to be far more respectful about what we do with consumer data. OK, last point on this, because I want to bring it back to where we started, which is about the say this um, a marketer or sorry, a publisher has very clean data, has all the permissions in line, is doing everything correctly yet it doesn't have um, demand side public de demand side platforms actually listing their inventory how do we how do we get to that place where everybody's on the same page because that's a simple organizational problem that's not a matter of whether or not you're compliant with gdpr that comes down to you have different entities interpreting gdpr differently and thus, deals are not getting done, even though the permissions are in place. So how do you manage that? I mean, is there any way to get around it? Or is it just, you know, working with all your demand side platforms to make sure that everybody's working off the same page? The only thing I mean, I found is that, you know, as as it appears that more and more people are, are taking this seriously and starting to implement the changes that they need to make, you know, according to the studies that I've I've read about it. Um, it seems obviously that the the advertisers will also hop on and the platforms will hop on so that people can actually start. <laughs> so the ads can start going through, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think from a software perspective, they don't want to lose these deals. So it's in their right. best interest to, to make this available and start implementing it in a way that serves their customer base. So it's a bump in the road right now. Yeah, I think it's just a gro it's like a growth, you know, one of those like growth problems, like, I don't know what pe I mean, they had so much time to like get up to speed. But for whatever reason, this is the kind of work that the like we continually put off instead of addressing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about television, because there was this interesting article that kind of outlined what exactly has happened with television over the past five years. And it's easy to forget just how far we've come. I mean, Nicole, when we look at the way television advertising is being done now, when we look at the way that we're consuming television, when we look at the fact that 
most of the networks out there have over-the-top solutions now and that streaming services have become the norm. Um, it's changed so radically in five years. My question is, do we respond to the changes that have happened already or are we better suited or better um, served by looking forward and saying, where are we going as opposed to where we are now? I think you have to start looking at where we're headed because, I mean, just look at, I mean, the the whole idea that if you remember um, Netflix, when they went from DVDs to streaming, how big of a deal it was and how much market share they lost and, you know, their stock price plummeted. And then next thing you know, oh, oh, look, this is actually working. This was a really smart move. And so I think as you're looking at where to go with TV, I think it's it's online. I think it's looking in new channels. I mean, to be honest, you can talk about the Netflixes and the Hulus and all of those, but I think there's far more streamed through YouTube right now than any of those channels. And YouTube is free and is offering paid options and is offering subscription op- options now. So really, it's the, the good news is, is that the TV is moving into channels that you, most marketers are already familiar with, and the ad platforms are... Easy, a little bit easier to use, and you're getting better data on the back end. Um, but this idea of traditional TV viewing, and even that will sit and watch commercials, like it's it's really interesting. Some of these TV shows where they force you to watch the commercials now and don't give you the skip option, and how like the attitude that you have towards that brand is like you're annoyed that they wouldn't let you skip their ad. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> like. It's, it's like, you know, this interruption style of marketing is annoying. And the more annoying we are, the less, the less brand loyalty we're going to get. So I think the big shift is to look at really how can you use these platforms in a way that I actually am going to be grateful for you inter- interrupting my programming. I remember watching 24 on Hulu some years ago, and, and the, every forced ad was the same Ford commercial. Yes, I remember that too. <laughs> I'm pulling my hair out of my head like, no, not again. I don't well, need a truck. You know, the, the worst part about the early <laughs> streaming experiences was when they would serve an ad and then it would crash the app and then you had to go back to the beginning of the program and you couldn't forward to the place, fast forward to the place where you were because you had the, all these ads that you had to look through. So, I mean, you know, at least we've gotten past that, even though we're still getting the same ad over and over again throughout the experience. But for Scott, I, I was before, just before, say really quick, Bob, we've gotten to the point where my kids, like two, we cut the cable like eleven years ago, and my kids, like about three years ago, my kids asked me what a commercial was. <laughs> I kid you not. That's so awesome, <laughs> Scott. I want to get your, I want to get your thoughts on this this situation before I um, delve into my thoughts about where the industry is moving. But where do you see the industry going, and where do we need to be moving in terms of our approach to advertising in order to better capture and better entertain and better inform our consumers? Well, I think I mean we just go look at how the power of the consumer. They want to get information when they want it, how they want it, and how they want to connect. And I think when we're looking at brands and how to connect with audiences, you just have to be flexible. I mean, we had a meeting just about two weeks ago about launching a whole series. And a lot of us that have been in the business for a while, we're thinking about launching this content series and doing a drip program and teasing it out. And then all the millennium said, no, no, you just, there's six films, just put them up one time and let everybody watch them like they do on Netflix. So it, it's literally a daily part of our life. Um, I think, I think, you know, the old days of, I mean, other than maybe, you know, real time news, sports, there's a few things that are just live events. That you just sometimes want to see at the moment, but a lot of other content, people want to just consume it when they want It's That's not going to change. And I think the networks that are figuring out how to connect and adapt are the ones that will survive. And there's obviously a th- lot of threats from these new models. You know, it's it's interesting you bring up when you want, because um, I'm actually more of the opinion that consumer opinion is shifting back to where you want, that that's the more important thing to deliver. And I, I've said this several times over the last few weeks uh, on the program and I still maintain that the, where the audience is moving is away from over the top, that we've 
gotten into this bind where we have the choice of 80 different channels that are all charging us $14 or $15 or $16 a month. And suddenly the, the average amount we're spending on TV is way more money than we were spending on cable. And we're realizing what we really wanted all along was just to be able to take our cable wherever we are, on our devices, on our phones, on our computers. I want to be able to watch the local news from New York when I'm in L.A. or San Francisco. Um, What do you guys think to that um, that model? Is that more important to is that more important to consumers to have a, a, a cable lineup that gives me all the programs that I want? but gives me the portability to take it everywhere I want to be and, you know, maybe offers a DVR portion so that I can get it when I want. But mainly it's about selection and portability. Um, I think, I mean, Netflix is, I mean, one of the reasons you're seeing such traction until the the recent earnings call where they maybe didn't meet the exact numbers of growth that have been going on for so long. But the fact that you check into a hotel room, and now you're seeing the Netflix button on your TV and you sit, you can sit there and log in. And, you know, you get on an airplane, everybody's got iPads and phones. I mean, it, it's just, this is the way people are consuming the content. So I think the more flexible you can be and the more options you can give, the better off you're gonna be. If you're gonna have a lot of restrictions and people are gonna keep bumping up against the wall, they're going to use probably an alternative that gives them less flexibility. I just think that's, that's today's era. It's a three screen era. And, uh, and if you count the TV, it's a fourth, right, from the tablet to the mobile to computer. And we're seeing everybody use all of them to consume what they want. I'm also seeing, like, people go, and, I mean, the Fire Stick is really, you know, popular mm. for those reasons, you mm-hmm. know. So it is portable. It has everything you need. Um, so I, I agree that, you know, being on all screens is really important. But I'm also, like, noticing that, you know, more and more people are just not watching TV the way that they used to, you know. Mm. Um, they're not watching this programming as much. They're watching different types of programming. We're seeing more and more people watching documentary-style stuff, watching self-improvement, personal development kind of stuff, and really wanting that inspiration over wanting entertainment. And I think, quite frankly, that's that's a good move for us. That's you know, that's pushing us towards expansion versus just like being entertained. And not that entertainment is is not important. I think it is. But I think we're choosing our entertainment, giving ourselves like a really small chunk of time for it because we're doing so much other stuff and using that time very intentionally. Yeah. And while audiences might be smaller for specific sh- for individual sh- programming or shows, um, you know, advertisers can be really savvy because they can hit and, and reach a, a very like a specific core target market who are watching that show. Of course, like Gaia is a good example, you know, where mm-hmm. it's all, um, you know, some really well produced, some really poorly produced um, content, but it's all focused around kind of like the evolution of humanity and consciousness. And so they they target and this is an interesting thing because I think as we start to look at where the industry is heading, I think looking at uh, connecting to tribes who want specific experiences is really where we're headed versus these segmentation approaches we've used in the past. Mm-hmm. Well, with that, it's time for the Ad Fail 5. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Dave Delaney. You can find him at futureforth.com. Um, a bunch of different ways you can spell that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, I've actually done something kind of fun. Um, I've started working more with businesses on helping them with their communication. And I've developed a workshop that is uh, tons of fun. And I will just, I won't ramble on about it. If you check out communicationreboot.com, um, you can find out more about that workshop, but it's, it's a lot of fun and it's something that I'm very excited about. And the feedback has been astounding for, uh, so far. So fingers crossed. That's keep on doing that. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Definitely. Thanks. We'll check that out. Uh, next up we have Scott Gardner. You can find him at liquidagency.com. That's the home of his agency. That is providing all kinds of amazing services, which you heard about him talk just a little bit during the program. But Scott, what would you like to promote about your shop or about anything at all? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to promote the fact that we, uh, we're an 18-year-old agency and we just went through a pretty big rebrand that started about a year ago. And it's it's around a lot of the topics that are coming up today. And we just uh, went from what we call 
a brand experience agency, which we evolved out of a traditional branding agency, and recently have um, realigned as brand culture um, agency. And we, we use the term uh, brand culture makers. Um, I think the, the reason for that is that about eight years ago, we started doing more internal ex employee experience work, and we were trying to tie it around brand, but also connect to the customer experience. So our big uh, move for the future, and we're seeing uh, a lot of work and a lot of success, is that we believe brands need to have solid strategy and connect the employee experience to the customer experience to the service experience. And that's the area that we're putting a ton of our focus and our, our future position. And um, it, it, it the only change is that some people think of brand culture means it's just the employee piece. And so we're having to redefine what brand culture means in the market, although we're seeing some uh, brand marketers talk about it the way that we are. So we're excited about that. It sounds like a really, really exciting move. So fantastic for you guys and hope it goes well. Uh, Thank you. And last but not least, Nicole Kelly, you can find her at ConsciousMarketingInstitute.com. That's where she is the conscious marketing uh, chief consciousness officer. Did I get that right? There's a lot of C's, right? <laughs> There's a lot of C's in there. But tell us, what's uh, going on in your world? What would you like to promote? Yeah, thank you so much. So um, there, we have two exciting announcements. The first is that um, we have the Conscious Marketing Podcast. So if you're listening to this podcast and you kind of like what... Um, we're talking about then, you know, the conscious marketing podcast is certainly an option. We basically talk about where the industry is headed um, and, and what this evolution of humanity is actually doing and providing opportunities for marketers. And then the other thing that's interesting that I didn't expect after I sold Social Media Explorer and SME Digital is that we've actually decided that we're going to open a division doing content marketing um, because as we look at conscious marketing and where we can have the most impact, we're finding that many companies are really looking for teams to really support them with inspirational and empowering messages that are designed to, you know, help humanity as a whole. So, um, so that's what's going on. And you can find more at consciousmarketinginstitute.com. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Awesome stuff. As for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. And of course, you can even find out how to advertise on the program. So check it out at thebeancast.com. And don't forget, transcribeme.com slash beancast is your source for all transcription services. And they are the official transcription partner of the Beancast. So if you like this episode and need to research a little bit about what was said, you can always check out our site at thebeancast.com within a week. And you will have a transcription of this episode available for you. So Definitely support our sponsor, transcribeme.com slash beancast. And now it's time for the Ad Fail 5, a rundown of the lowest moments in advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. First up, Lad Bible was supposed to be losing the bro vibe. You know what I'm talking about, Scott. <laughs> it built its <laughs> reputation on this whole bro thing. So imagine the surprise of everyone when their Arabian-themed summer Oh, the, you know, when I, as soon as I read Arabian theme summer party, I thought uh, <laughs> you really should have thought twice about this. But apparently the organizers of the party were not really certain what exactly was going to be provided by the vendor who provided a stripper. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. So, Scott, yeah, what, what, what's going on here? <laughs> well, they, they said it was actually a topless burlesque dancer. Doesn't that make it better uh, <laughs> via language? You know? Got pasties. Um, well, you know, look, I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think the challenge for brands are, you know, if, you know, I mean, everybody's under fire for more responsibility and more just, just being better citizens. And I think when you're not, we're seeing it right away because of the impact of social and people recording things in live everywhere and hide. Um, I think if you're going to be a bro brand, you know, then just you got to you got to you can't hide your bro. Um, you know, I look at like the Chive down in Austin. I mean, they're they're they are who they are, and they uh, you know they their content is their content. Either you either go whether you agree with it or not. At least they embrace it. I think for a company this big to start trying to make the change, they're going to have hiccups because they built the brand in one manner with one attitude, and as they're shifting it, it takes a while to get everybody aligned to actually truly shift so mistakes will happen yeah absolutely now next up when discussing how they were cleaning up facebook there nicole mark zuckerberg told an interviewer that they still need to balance free speech and use the example of how they still allowed holocaust deniers on the mm -hmm. site 
<laughs> you know, uh, Nicole, I understand what he was trying to get at. He's trying to say, well, I don't agree with Holocaust deniers, but we've got to allow some room for free speech while we're getting rid of fake news. But that seemed like the worst example he could have possibly used. And I can picture every single PR person in behind the scenes just shaking their head when he said it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, well, first of all, you talk about Holocaust deniers and then you talk about that you're essentially going to be this like dictator deciding what is and isn't appropriate on your site. So I mean, the misalignment is just like across the board. And I think it's really time for Mark Zuckerberg to recognize he is in way over his head right now. And he really needs some support to ensure civil rights aren't violated, like legitimately, but also that like, he's just not saying things that are really unconscious because, you know, Hey, there's, there's flat earthers to protect. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Now British airways started blocking. I love this story. The British airways started blocking customers from checking in for flights, Dave, if they were using ad blockers, <laughs> then in response to Twitter complaints about the fact that passengers could not check into the flights because of this, they were asking the flyers to publicly tweet their personal information in order to resolve the issue. <laughs> Uh, this makes me always wonder like who is running your Twitter account, <laughs> right? Because obviously that was just such a bad idea and also blocking like ad blockers. I mean, then you're blocking browsers, aren't you at this point? It's just so crazy, you know, to say to a passenger, even though we allowed you to make a reservation, we're not going to actually let you check in because you're using an ad blocker. I mean, what a terrible, terrible customer experience. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. Well, I don't know. I think they might be um, affected by that giant screaming baby. (laughs) Is it it just me or does the airline industry that's most regulated with the most rules make the most mistakes when it comes to customer experience? It just goes from one to the next. It's a trend that I don't think we'll ever stop seeing. It really, really does. Next up, the Papa John's fiasco keeps growing, Scott. The former chairman now claims that former agency laundry service tried to extort $6 million to make the story go away. (laughs) The agency vigorously denies it. I don't know who to believe anymore. I mean, this is like such a disastrous situation, both for Papa John's and for everybody who was involved with them. (laughs) Yeah, it. This reminds me of things going on with our president and Cohen and everybody else. It's all, and it happens at a pizza chain, right? This is they sell pizza. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, but it just shows. I mean, you know, this. It's amazing how much news hit on, on this issue, and it kept growing every day. And you know, this is the kind of client that actually, you know, that is in crisis and one that, you know, this is the type of work we'd like to do because they're gonna have to completely reinvent the culture and leadership mm-hmm. and you know they've talked about do they change it to papa jacks do they take it you know they're taking him off the boxes he's got to get the building but when you have somebody that's so far out there representing the brand one mishap by that individual and the brand can be in crisis and here we're seeing it in a in a big big time and there's a lot of different places you can buy pizza Meanwhile, you also have Domino's filling potholes in cities and putting their stamp on it. Probably the best (laughs) advertising strategy ever. That was clever. Anything that involves any pizza chain just makes me really crave pizza. (laughs) (laughs) As soon as I hear any of these brands, I'm like, damn, I'm hungry. So what you're saying is basically Nazi pizza still makes you hungry for pizza. (laughs) (laughs) No, but Mark Zuckerberg will allow them to speak about it on Facebook. Well, it was, a, it was a rough week, you know, last week and a half with the Uber COO going down, Texas Instruments CEO, Papa John more in the news, and then Zuckerberg. So uh, it is a tough time to be in the, in the spotlight with everything and how people are looking at the leadership and how these brands are behaving. And one last bad fell of the week, if anyone should be able to keep their servers up during an online sale promotion, it should probably be Amazon, Nicole. Instead, Prime Day started off with a whole lot of very, very sad dog images. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe this, you know, because I, I, I actually checked it out within the first few minutes. Um, I managed to get logged in for maybe about two minutes, and then after that, dogs for the next five hours. It was incredible. <laughs> it, was like, it was like kittens with screwdrivers on Twitter in the early days. 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, well, it just goes to show you that like even the best can sometimes like misplan for an event and have more people than they expected to show up. You know, I like I'm somebody who goes to Burning Man and they have 70,000 people try to come online and get tickets and they figured this out. So (laughs) I'm surprised that and I think they might use Amazon, shockingly enough. So this might be an issue. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Amazon runs the Internet. Amazon Web Services runs the friggin Internet. You'd think they'd have this. They outsource their hosting. <laughs> I, re- <laughs> I really thought this was a PR stunt at first, like when it when it first went down. Uh, but but as it got longer, it was obvious it wasn't. But when it first went down, I thought this could be a PR stunt. Well, the, have the s- only thing I found after 28 years of being embroiled in Silicon Valley is the one thing about technology companies, especially brands that are trusted, they they do get the opportunities to fail and it, it doesn't it's not always catastrophic it, it is it happens i think people how often does my netflix crash too right but you just become more tolerant that it is technology and it doesn't always work so i'm sure amazon will recover fine although their competitors uh, i'm sure are licking their chops yeah absolutely well have something to add to this list or just want to discuss it comment online use the hashtag adfail5 that's pound adfail and the number five Well, that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an iTunes listener, we've also provided a direct link to the iTunes Music Store or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory of iTunes. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then.